Someday soon, my Savior will call out my name. Hi everyone, glad you're here tonight and I hope you're ready for a Bible class. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Last week we discussed how much love there was in what God Almighty did when He sent His Son into this world to save a poor lost sinner like me. And the amount of love that is is overwhelming and uh, it uh, will reduce you to tears if you think about it very much. Tonight I want to talk to you about that love bringing about something. So look in Romans chapter 6. And by the way, last weekend we had a Bible conference in Chattanooga, Tennessee at the Grace Bible Church there. And there is a website called understandingyourbible.com understandingyourbible.com If you go there, you can look at the archive and get the messages from that Bible conference. And I highly recommend Brother Dan Gross on Saturday night did a message on Romans chapter 6. If you want to understand Romans 6, I highly recommend you listening to Brother Dan Gross's message Saturday night at the Bible conference um, uh, on understandingyourbible.com. I think you'd really enjoy that. If you enjoy Bible study, I know you're going to enjoy Dan's explanation of Romans chapter 6. But I want to use part of Romans chapter 6, not teach it tonight, but I want to use part of it to further the idea that all the love that was bestowed upon us, as we talked about last week, all the love that was bestowed upon us by Christ dying for our sins, by God so loving the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and that that Son carried out that message, I want to, to go from... Uh, from that kind of a picture we were talking about last week to what happens now that we've received that love. Notice he says in verse 11. Romans 6 verse 11 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now imagine you, whoever you are, wherever you are, how, how old you are, I don't care. Imagine you being alive unto God. If you are alive unto God, do you know what that means? It means God sees you as a live person. God Almighty, the creator of all things, sees you. If you are alive unto God, if, you're, if you are crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, resurrected with Christ, you are alive unto God. And the first ten verses of this chapter shows you that if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, that is the condition you're in. You're a part of who He is. And alive unto God through Jesus Christ's activity. Now he goes on to say, verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. What, what, then shall, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Now watch these next three verses. Know ye not that to whom you yield your servant... I'm sorry. <clears throat> know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants you are to whom you obey. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin... But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, and the short term of that is free from the penalty of sins, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Now, I want to talk to you about being servants of righteousness. We have, in the Word of God, the perfect righteousness of God. It shows the righteousness of God without putting any of us under a law which would condemn us. Go back to Romans chapter 3. Look in Romans 3, verse 10. As it is written, and Paul's going to quote eight Old Testament passages here. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Well, that's pretty conclusive. Where does that leave people then? It leaves them in great need. Look, if you will, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, 
that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So it isn't Jesus Christ who came into the world to condemn the world, but rather the law of God, which was righteous, according to uh, Moses. The law of God condemns men. Why does the law of God condemn men? Because it is righteous and man cannot obey that law. So well, surely they can if they try. No, surely they cannot, no matter how hard they try. I mean, come on, there was a whole nation given that law all at once, and God was there with them, traveling with them, fighting their battles for them, giving them the hope of a land that flowed with milk and honey, and called the promised land, and called that which was given to the, their father Abraham, and all of those good and precious gifts that were given unto them, including all the wondrous signs that were given unto them. And these people rebelled against the law of God, rebelled against God himself, wanted no, uh, Moses to be dead and I don't know what all went on who did they think they were well I tell you who they were they were flesh and from the time that God Almighty told Adam of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat for then the day you eat thereof thou shalt surely die and when God Almighty told him that it was the only law that Adam had but when the temptation came, Adam sinned. Through Adam, we've all sinned. Look back in chapter 5, just a moment. Verse 12. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for the all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of, the, of him that was to come. Adam sinned. Everybody in Adam sinned. 1 Corinthians 15 says, As in Adam all die. Why? Sin kills. Go back to chapter 3 again. Verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But then he says, but now. He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now here's the kicker. It is unto all. And then he goes on to say, and upon all them that believe. For there's no difference. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. And yet the free justification. Brought about by that great love we spoke about last week. Is unto all. And that justification is then upon all them that believe. Now that's who I'm talking to. Have you trusted Christ? Do you know that there was a moment in your life. A time, a moment, an event in your life when knowing that you had no other hope, that you could not save yourself, was there a time when you trusted Christ as your Savior? I love to hear people's testimonies. If you'd care to write that to me, I love to read their testimonies. I was saved when I was 22. I was raised in, uh, in and around Baptist churches all my life. My father was a Baptist preacher. But it was a, more, like, more like a free will Baptist and a hard shell type Baptist in, in that they did not believe in eternal security or anything like that. And yet I knew Christ died for my sins. I started going to a, an American Baptist church in Columbus, Indiana for a brief period of time before we moved to Danville, Illinois where we went to another American Baptist church. And the preachers of those two churches both taught me of this love. They didn't do a good job teaching me the Bible, but they taught me what Christ had done for me. And it wasn't that I wouldn't have known that from my upbringing, but they taught me what He did for me. And so the night when I finally got the lowest that I ever been, and all I could see of myself was a filthy, dirty rag 
full of hypocrisy and many other things. And when I got low enough, I gave up on myself. And the Lord saved me. It was trusting Christ that caused my salvation. He's the only Savior I ever knew of, nor believed there ever was. So you might say I spent a lot of years under conviction, although I'd been pretty callous to it. But that night, I trusted Christ as my Savior, believing that He'd saved me. Now, look here in Romans chapter uh, six, um, Romans chapter uh, three again. I'm sorry, back up. Go back to Romans chapter three and notice this this great verse here. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law. Verse 22, the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Okay, now we come back to this. Do you have a testimony of salvation? Amen if you do. If you don't, the rest of this is not to you, for you, or about you. It's to, for, and about those who have a testimony of salvation. Turn to 2 Corinthians Chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I want you to notice something that's going to show up here in this next few verses, both in chapter 4 and chapter 5, that we're going to, we're going to spot here in these verses, and we're going to see what we talked about last week concerning the love of God, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, start with me in verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants. We read that word back in Romans chapter 6, remember? Servants of righteousness. Paul says, ourselves, your servants, talking to the Corinthians, for Jesus' sake, verse 6, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Boy, you couldn't get any more earthen than mine. I mean, it's just stinky. It's just made out of clay. Got a little blood running through it and <laughs> some oxygen every now and then going into the lungs so I can stay alive here. But it's just clay. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Notice, if you will, about this love. Keep reading. Verse 13, he says, We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. He says, We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus, think of the love now, he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Great picture. For several verses then he goes on about what we're going to be in glory and then he goes on about how we're going to get from here to glory and what we have to face when we get there called the judgment seat of Christ. Now I want you to pick up in chapter 5 right after that. Verse 12. For we commend not ourselves again unto you. I have to think about that. We don't commend. Men don't commend themselves to other people. You know why? Because ego sticks out all over your chest when you try to do that kind of thing. You can't do it. You don't commend yourself to other people. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Now watch. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Oh, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What for? Ourselves? No. So that when we commend the Lord unto people, He's the one that's seen and not us. For the love of Christ constraineth us. To be constrained is to press, be pressed forward. To be constrained is to, is to be urgent about something. 
For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. That's an interesting picture. Why should we take that approach? Because we're dead and our life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3 says that. You're dead. And your life is hid with Christ. You are in Christ or you're not. You're, or you're dead dead. If you're not in Christ, you have no hope. If you have Christ, you're, in, you're living in hope. And you're living in a hope that's got you captured, if you will, captivated in Christ. He bought you. You belong to Him. Now with that in mind, think about the love again. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Now when he goes on about being constrained by the love of Christ, it is for the benefit of a word coming forth. In other words, he's got some word to come forth. Remember the idea in, in Romans chapter 6, and we read it again in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, is to be servant-like. Okay? Notice, if you will, in verse uh, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, I want to show you something just as a diagram. I apologize for the crudeness of this. But here's the day you're born. I don't think that one's going to work. We'll throw it away. Here's the day you were born. Well, how did these all go bad all at once here? Here's the day you were born. And here's the day you were saved. All of this is a chaotic mess. You may have had a great ordered life. You may have been the star athlete in your school. You may have been loved by everyone. But this is a big mess where God Almighty is concerned. You know why? Because you didn't know Christ. So you went from the day you were born until the day when you trusted Christ as your Savior. And lo and behold, you are a new man. Make any difference about your gender. A new man. And you're going forth over here as a new man. And you're going forth unto Christ. In other words, why is it you're going forth? Well, you, know, you didn't just die. The moment you trusted Christ as your Savior, you, <coughs> excuse me, you didn't die and go to heaven. You kept living. <clears throat> so if you've trusted the Lord as your Savior, and therefore you're still living, then there's something for you to live for. There's something for this new man to be caught up in. Okay? Therefore, verse 17, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All of this is gone. This is like gone. Not being able to be seen. <clears throat> um, Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This is all new. This is the new man, and this is all new. Everything is new. God, as it were, from heaven, begins to see you right here. This, from here on, this is all viewed by God Almighty. So, well, I don't like that. It doesn't make any difference whether you like it or not. But the good news is, God isn't looking at you. He's looking at you with the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. If you're, in, if you're saved, God sees you as He sees His Son. So, well, that doesn't seem fair to Christ. It isn't fair to Christ. But Christ loved us and gave Himself for us. Amen? So think of the love. Think of the love that Christ displayed when He died for us in spite of once we were saved, we still foul this whole thing up in the world's worst form and way. Isn't that something? And as as was mentioned many times before and probably will be mentioned again very soon, we've split this thing into hundreds and even thousands of denominations that can't even agree which side of the street to build a church on. As though the Lord had told them to build a church. He never told anybody to build a church. 
No preacher in the world today is hearing from God with a voice. Somebody hears God talking to them, he's a good guy to get away from. You know why you know that? Because all of God's word is complete from the day Paul finished writing it. He was given a dispensation of God to fulfill the word of God. He wrote it. He was the last one to write. And when he finished 2 Timothy chapter 4, nobody else is talking to God. 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle Paul said, Of seeing the Lord from heaven, last of all he was seen of me as the one born out of due time. Then when the Lord saw Paul for the last time, no one has seen the Lord from heaven since then. And from the time his word was recorded, God has said all he's going to say on the subject, and no one is hearing God's voice today. And I don't care who he is or how big a jet plane he's got. If you have a thing like that, compare him to Jesus Christ and think whether or not that would really be from God in the first place, right? Notice in, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 then, verse 18, And all things are of God. See, if you're in Christ, you're a new man viewed by God according to Christ, and you're, see, you're being seen as though Christ is working in you. And it's Christ who judges you at the judgment seat. Verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That be all saved people. Once again, if you don't have a testimony of salvation, this is not to you, nor for you, nor about you. It's about saved people. And to many of you, it's partly because you won't get out of the mess you're in. Back in the passage, he says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself, I'm in verse 18, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, now think about this. This is a ministry here of reconciliation. If it is a ministry of reconciliation, what is going to take place in this ministry? Then if it, if it takes place properly, what does reconciliation bring about? God is not angry with man anymore. How do you know that? The next verse says, to wit. In other words, here's what the ministry of reconciliation is all about. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them. So God has reconciled Himself to the world. Now notice, the, the, here's how the ministry then is. He, see, again, verse 18, end of the passage, verse 18. Hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now look at verse 20. Now then we, we, who have the ministry of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Oh, now the world out here, all of the world needs to be reconciled unto God. God has reconciled the world unto himself by not imputing their trespasses. Now the world needs to be reconciled unto God. Now I want you to think back to the idea of how much love is bestowed here. Love, love in such a manner that it would include the likes of you and me. I mean, I don't know all of you, but I know some of you, and I know the character of mankind, and I know the stench that comes out of the the sin and degradation of this world we live in. And yet He saved us. Yet He called us. Yet He gave us a ministry. The ministry of getting other people to understand their reconciliation with God Almighty. Isn't that something? And the answer is yes, that is. That's really something. Look if you will in Ephesians chapter 4. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2. And again, this is to save people. If you don't have a testimony of salvation, that is, this is not spoken to you. This is spoken to people who know that they belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. If you don't belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have to stand up or sit down or sign a card or go through eight classes or any such thing as that. You need to trust Christ as your Savior. He died for you. 
God raised him from the dead to prove your sins were forgiven. All you have to do is trust him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. And to all of us here who are saved. Look in Ephesians chapter 2. And look in Ephesians 2 verse 1. And you, us saved people. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. That old dude is out there. That prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And by the way the desires of the flesh and mind are probably not what you're thinking about. The desires of the flesh and, and mind was to be religious and make God like you. Or fool somebody into believing that God did like you. It's hypocrisy. It's what Cain did that got him in trouble. It's what Balaam tried to get done and God wouldn't let him do it. It's like many other examples in the Bible. King Saul, before David took over, did the same thing. He's just going to bring back God some perfect sacrifice, remember? Now look, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But... God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Can you get a grip on that? The great love that God had for us, rich in God's mercy, brought we who were dead in sins into a quickened state a done deal. He hath already, past tense, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Verse 5. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, verse 6. And hath raised us up together. Also past tense. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's a done deal. We're there. But wait. We're still. Wait. 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 We're still here. We're still here. Yes, because we have this job of ambassadors to bring people unto the reconciliation that God has brought to them. God reconciled Himself to the world. Now He tells us, tell people, be ye reconciled to God. So when I just pronounced there a while ago, to those of you who have never trusted Christ as your Savior, this is not written to you. It's written to us that we might tell you. Our job is to tell you how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that when Christ went there, He went there because of our offenses. And that when God raised Him from the dead, He was raised from the dead without our sins. And that includes your sins. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, He'll save you in spite of yourself. He will save you for Christ's sake. Because of this great love. Rich in mercy, great love. Verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Salvation is a free gift. You don't do anything for it except trust Christ. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I've always thanked God for that most. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I can see salvation free and clear if I get myself free and clearly out of the picture. And only what Christ did, making the difference. Verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometime afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. I hope you've trusted Christ as your Savior. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior at any time, whether you're, whether you're watching this program or not, but if you've trusted in Christ recently and you're watching this program, I would appreciate hearing from you. I'm not interested in keeping track of who gets saved and who doesn't keep, get saved. That's the Lord's business. He's got a better computer than me. But I would love to hear it. I love to hear personal testimonies. And I thank you for being here tonight, and I hope the Bible class is a blessing to you. And you come back next week, same time. Good night, everybody. Someday soon I'll be in heaven.
someday soon we'll